Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Scintillating 15 and 15. And I am happy today to introduce a wonderful librarian, Kristen Wixon. So take it away, Kristen. Hey. Um, so true to form, back when Robin proposed this, and she said, you know, come up, come over the topic. I was like, hey, algorithms, right? That'll be fun. That'll be an interesting thing to talk about. Of course, I pick something like, you can't cover that in 15 minutes, right? <laughs> you can't cover that in a week. Um, so we're going to narrow the focus a little bit for today. Um, I'm going to talk about the way that algorithms impact the information we see uh, when we are an active searcher, when we're confronted with a search box um, that we have to type something into. Like, I'm not going to talk about algorithms in social media or news feeds, which could be a whole other topic, which I would be into, but it's not what we're going to do today. Um, we're just going to focus on I'm a searcher and I'm dealing with algorithms. Um, so the quote that I've got up on the screen right now is from um, a survey that was, it was a lot of focus groups of college students. And what they found was that they just have this overwhelming confidence in Google. Uh, something shows up at the top of a Google search results list. They consider it the capital T truth. Like it's for sure it's real because Google said, right? Um, so this idea is prevalent among our students. Maybe even we fall prey to this sometimes. Um, and we might be thinking, well, one of the problems is that Google knows so much about us, it has this capacity to kind of personalize results. Um, if we were having the conversation about social media feeds, um, I would say, yeah, that, that's a bigger deal. But when we're talking about search engines, I think that is actually a, a much smaller deal. Yeah, it can happen, but it's not um, going to be the, the make or break point. I think the thing that these search engines, and I'm probably going to say Google a lot, but really everything I'm saying today is also true of, of DuckDuckGo, um, Bing, whatever you got. Um, what they care about is relevance, right? Above all, they want the things that show up in your um, search um, results to be relevant to the words that you had put into the search box. Um, yes, there's a lot of data points that they use to decide what goes to the top of the list, um, but far and away, the most important thing is relevance to the search terms you selected. So that kind of leaves us open to a couple different potential problems. One of them is this idea of uh, ideological dialects. That's a, that's a phrase from um, Francesca Tripodi. Um, she's actually got a book out pretty recently um, the propagandist's playbook. You should look it up. It's, I'm not done, but it's very good. Um, so anyway, ideological dialect is this idea that depending on what you already believe, you're going to use different words. You're going to choose different vocabulary to search. The example that she uses a lot is um, if you have a negative uh, conception of immigration um, and it's election time, maybe you do a search on illegal alien voter fraud. Um, but if you have a more positive view of immigration, maybe you do a search for what is essentially the same thing, right? Undocumented immigrant voting rights. Uh, try it at home. You will get very different search results for these two things. Um, so that, that's, that's like a very obvious example, but it shows up in smaller ways, other smaller language choices we use. The relevance-seeking um, algorithm of Google will really hone in on those and shunt you towards one kind of um, result or another. Um, and what, another way this plays out is uh, when we are choosing between words that might be what experts or scholars are using and what more lay people are using, right? So I'm not a criminal justice um, scholar, so like I might talk about repeat offenders, whereas if you actually study this stuff, you probably use the term recidivist. So um, Again, these subtle choices in our language, we put them in the search box, we get pushed to different um, places on the web. Uh, and then a second problem that can come up is something called data voids. So Google really, really wants to give us results, but what if there's not very much on a topic? What if there's very little content associated with a particular phrase? Um, then all of these other markers that Google uses to, to float results to the top, they go out the window because I mean, there's just not very many results. Um, one example is the, the idea of a crisis actor. So if you had Googled that before Sandy Hook, um, very few results, almost, almost zero. And it referred to like people who actually helped train EMTs or whatever. 
Um, but these data voids can be very easily exploited by media manipulators. So um, folks came along, they created content around a new meaning of crisis actor, right? That isn't real, um, but they created enough content around the phrase. They started using the phrase on their blogs or podcasts and would say, you know, do your own research, crisis actor, crisis actor, do your own research, like it's a thing. And they kind of drove traffic. And so if um, no one else is using that phrase, because it's not real, you know, to rebut it, then people who visit Google, they only see that content, right? So there's definitely some potentially pretty, pretty problematic things that can happen there. Oh, there's a link on the, on the handout to a video around um, the phrase black on white crime, which again, if you actually study crime, is not a phrase that anybody uses um, and had very unfortunate repercussions. Uh, so what do we do? What do we do about this? I think there's two pieces um, to look at. One is kind of surfacing some of these problems and making them more visible for students, and then also giving students uh, an idea of like what else they could do instead of just blindly trusting Google. Um, so first up, what can we do to help students notice these problems? Um, all these five things I'm mentioning here are also on the handout in a little more detail. Um, one thing we haven't mentioned yet is that Google is going to reproduce whatever biases we all already have, right? It is fed on all this data of what people have searched for and then subsequently clicked on. Um, so all of, you know, all of us flawed biased humans have given Google this data. And so it's, you know, potentially going to reproduce those biases. Um, some folks might already be familiar with the work of Sophia Noble. She's got a great book, Algorithms of Oppression. Um, and so like one interesting exercise you could try with students would be to have them Google um, a marginalized or stereotyped group maybe one that they consider themselves a member of, um, and have them look at the autofill suggestions that Google provides you. Have them look at what a Google image search returns. Um, I guarantee you, uh, there will be stuff to talk about in there for sure. Um, search term subtlety. Um, so there's really easy and not loaded ways you can kind of expose students to this idea that their search terms really matter. Um, I stole this one from Alice Pierman. She, she would show students a picture of something really innocuous, like a field of sunflowers, um, and ask students what words they associate with the picture. I mean, it seems really obvious, but um, sunflowers or field of sunflowers or sunflower farm all actually return completely different sets of results, which students find pretty surprising. Um, so you could do that with some. Um, pictures related to your, your course as well. Um, to get back to the, the ideological dialect and the data void examples, um, can you can students come up with any of these examples of um, diff people with different opinions using different search terms? You might need to prompt them by giving them uh, two readings, two sample readings, and see if they can pick out the language that's being used by different groups. Um, and then lastly, Engaging students in a discussion of why we are so trusting of Google. Um, so, so many other areas, I feel like we are appropriately skeptical of corporate motives, but we are just willing to hand over the keys to Google and it's fine. Um, so like, why is that? And like, what's the role that convenience plays in driving us down that path? Um, what are the trade-offs, you know, talking explicitly about what we give up if that's all we, we use for our search? Um, and then the idea of like, when is, when is it worth it to do a little more work? Um, so if you need a chicken recipe, like whatever, <laughs> you don't need to think overthink it. But uh, if you're forming your policy opinions, right? Like pr probably you wanna be really mindful, slow down and, and think about where your info is coming from. Um, so, so lastly, I have some suggestions about how you can expose uh, students to other practices. So the, the first one is one I think you could incorporate in any class, even like a lower level class students are interested in this. But if you're going to use Google, you can do something fancy like this site colon trick. Um, so you can see in the example here, uh, you can just type site colon and then um, 
a domain, part of a domain. Um, so in this case, I'm telling Google, hey, I want you to search only the American Library Association website and all of its divisions and special interest groups uh, for the word algorithm, right? So just that site. Um, you could do the same thing even more broadly. You could say site colon dot gov and only get government information. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things you can do with that instead of just accepting what Google gives you. Um, I can also imagine some fun exercises where um, you compare the results you get with the same search term in Google and say a library database. I guarantee you there are phrases you can stick in a library database and you're gonna get zero results, right? Like that's why all the students are using Google. Um, but what does that tell you about the words that they've chosen, right? Um, I think you, that's a good starting point for conversation as well. If you teach um, upper level courses or, or courses in your discipline, I think there's some really great opportunities here for helping students develop their disciplinary awareness. Um, starting even just with making explicit your own habits about information seeking. Um, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure like we aren't all just relying on Google to stay current in our field. So what are the things that we actually do and, and telling students about those and inviting any guests you have in the class to also talk about, well, how do they get information and where do they search? And have students, I don't know, there could be a good reflection activity where they think about what they do and compare it to what you have said as well. Um, I have ideas about a really fun exercise where students uh, kind of generate like a crowdsourced list uh, within your discipline. What are the major organizations and projects and journals and blogs and scholars, you know, like what, what are the, the orgs that are central in your discipline? Um, because once you have that, and you know, that might be something you're already talking with your students about, but once you have that, you can do interesting things kind of related to this whole site colon search. Um, you can design a custom Google search. It's basically the same thing as that site trick, um, but you can include up to 10 domains. So for example, on here, um, and this is hyperlinked, I'll share the slides. That link, I built a custom search um, for critical information studies. So if I wanted to know what the perspective of critical info studies was on algorithms, I would go to my little custom Google search, which searches, you know, journal of critical library studies, you know, just things like that, and actively get that perspective, right? Like we tell students, oh, go seek other perspectives, but sometimes we don't always tell them how. So this is, this is one way. Um, you can do something very similar on Twitter. If you find a lot of scholars who are active on Twitter, you can make a list. Um, and there are ways you can search the list. So here's my some of people on my info literacy list. I could do a Twitter search just in that list to find out what those folks are saying about algorithms. Uh, and then the last thing I would mention is just really kind of intentionally diversifying sources, right? Like it takes a little bit of work, but thinking about what voices are not regularly heard in your disciplinary conversations and and showing students how to actually find those as well. Um, great, so that's it. If you came here and you were hoping I was gonna talk about social media feeds uh, and that kind of algorithmic nonsense, um, there are some links on my handout to that and I'd be very happy to chat with you later. Um, and oh, if you're into this thing and you want, and you want to chat, uh, we can set up a meeting and I can either um, like help brainstorm with you things you're going to do in class. And I'm also happy to visit classes as well to talk about any of these topics. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Kristen. Um, thanks everybody for coming. I love that topic. That was as usual, super, super interesting. Um, so thanks for coming. I'm going to stop recording, but you guys are welcome to hang out a couple minutes, especially if you have questions.